Welcome to the Today's Leader Podcast. Building Tomorrow's Best Leaders, Today. Way to go, guys. Way to go. Keep it going. Good job, guys. All right, Paul. I see you. All right, John. Finish. Let's go. Hey there, it's Coach Curl here and welcome to episode 446 of the Today's Leader podcast, Building Tomorrow's Best Leaders Today. Now let's face it, leaders face many challenges in business and most notably this has been evident the last few years. But let's face it, prior to that, many industries always face things like crisis, chaos on a regular basis, whether it's through things like digital transformation or disruption, that word that many leaders hate, disruption. The world continues to change as quickly as we have ever seen it. Now, business is important. We know that. There's a lot of important things in business, but it's rarely life or death. Now, in some occupations, getting consistency in a crisis can seriously be a life or death moment. Which brings us to our guest today. Marty Strong is a retired Navy SEAL officer and combat veteran. He's a novelist, a practicing CEO and chief strategy officer, and the author of Be Nimble, How the Creative Navy SEAL Mindset Wins on the Battlefield and in Business. He's got a second book that's coming, Be Visionary, Strategic Leadership in the Age of Optimization, and that's set for release at the end of this year. Now, Marty's travelled to over 40 countries. He's been shot in a few, he tells me, survived cancer twice and experienced the loss of his oldest son. He spent a lifetime meeting challenges head-on, succeeding in three professions, anticipating crisis and leading through chaos and crisis. This is a conversation that you certainly do not want to miss. So after a word once again from our sponsor, Think and Grow Business, it's my pleasure to welcome Marty Strong to the podcast. The podcast is brought to you by Think and Grow Business, the home of the Think and Grow Business Mastermind. If you're serious about growing your business, get serious and join a mastermind group today. Find out more at thinkandgrowbusiness.com.au. And it's my pleasure to welcome to the Today's Leader podcast, Building Tomorrow's Best Leaders Today. Please welcome the author of Be Nimble, Marty Strong. How are you today, Marty? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I am fantastic. Just the start of the day for me. It's the end of the day for you. So um, it's going to be a great Friday. That's all I'm, I'm saying. I've got a very busy, impactful day ahead. So... Um, Share the Marty Strong story with our listeners. Yeah, so if you're familiar with the United States and you just put your finger smack dab in the center of it, that's where I was born, in the state of Nebraska. So on the Great Plains, uh, where all the buffalo used to roam, that's where I was born and raised for the most part. I spent four years in Japan as a kid uh, when my my father had a job with the U.S. Army as a civilian. Uh, Eventually uh, graduated high school when I was 17 and went into the Navy. And I did the uh, the Navy thing for 20 years. Half of that, I was an enlisted SEAL, uh, you know, special operations uh, guy. And the second half, I was an officer in that same SEAL unit. So did 20 years, got out, uh, managed money for seven years with uh, United Bank of Switzerland as a portfolio manager, and then wanted to start leading companies and, and doing more corporate and business development and startup work. Mm-hmm. Can I just ask, uh, completely off the record, is is the competition between the Navy SEAL and the Coast Guard what what, what we see in the movies? Is it it that sort of a um, competitive environment between those two organizations? Sure. I mean, any elite unit is highly competitive by nature. So, you know, SEALs and and Marines, SEALs and Green Berets, SEALs and and, uh, Metro SWAT guys, Coast Guard, yeah, we... You know, there's a lot of esprit de corps, a lot of pride, and a lot of effort put into being being the best. So, sure. Yeah. Excellent. Now, you've written Be Nimble. What was the premise of behind writing that book? And I know you've got a new one coming out, so we'll talk about that in a sec. So let's talk about Be Nimble from a leadership aspect. What, what was it about? Um, what compelled you to write the book? Sure. 
Well, I mean, the thesis is kind of in the subtitle, um, How the Creative Navy SEAL Mindset Wins on the Battlefield and in Business. And it was a way to kind of put a bridge from or between my experience as a leader in an elite unit and the lessons learned there. Not all applicable, you know, outside of uh, military service, but a lot of them were. And then my experience for the last 20 years in business and lots of different kinds of business and leading uh, teams and then eventually leading um, companies. So I thought if uh, someday if I wanted to segue into a, uh, a business doing consulting and, and speaking and, and writing as my sole vocation, mm-hmm. that uh, that I should go ahead and put all my thoughts on paper and what is it that Marty really thought about all these topics. So Be Nimble was really, it's, a, it's, a, it's written in a mentoring style directed at aspiring leaders or existing leaders and yeah. it's more about dynamic chaotic kind of crisis environments of leadership where you've got to be really on on the ga- on your game if you're going to be leading mm. and i guess the last two years we've seen that haven't we uh, the the crisis leadership uh, um well the crisis has enveloped the world it has really allowed some leaders to stand tall and we've also seen some leaders almost like withdraw into themselves so what are some of the the traits that you see in leaders that are possibly negative traits that your book will help them with? So there's a there's a chapter in the book where I talk about the hero complex, and I think it's probably appropriate to your question. A lot of people, you know, obviously regard heroism uh, very highly, but in business, just like in the military, usually if you're a hero, something probably went wrong. And, mm. you know, think about it, anybody in the military that's wearing medals, that said I was in a big battle or a big fight and I got shot and my buddies got shot and all that. That wasn't because everything went really well. <laughs> That's because everything didn't really well, didn't go well. And you stepped up, you did yeah. something very heroic. In the case of leadership in a business, stepping up in, in a crisis, whether it's an external one like the pandemic or an internal one, say your company's threatened by an outside competitor or you're, you're trying to change a strategy and everything seems to be unraveling because nobody knows how to align the organization. Mm-hmm. you don't want to be a hero in that situation either. It's too much to ask of any one person as a leader. What you want to do is you want to try to prevent this kind of, this kind of heroism being required by anticipating these challenges, anticipating yeah. these, these threats, building coherent, cross-trained uh, teams with deep bench strength that don't require you to jump in and pull them out of the water when things start to go sideways. Okay. So do you, in the, in, so in the business world, do you see people, so I, I've got a, 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 a visual in my head around the concept of being nimble. So we're building great, strong teams that are empowered and we're not necessarily the leader that's out there fighting all the fires, is, which is what we fundamentally see a lot in business. We, I, not necessarily at CEO level, but much further down, we seem to have a range of middle managers that, you know, and whether we call them trying to be the hero, they're the ones trying to fix everyone's problems and, and put out fires. What is it that you see with that? Is there an, an attitude that you can work with with that particular leader or is that something that they've fallen prey to that they're always going to potentially have as one of those negative traits, trying to put out every fire, being very reactive and and leading in that particular way? Sure. So in the same same uh, chapter of the book, on, on uh, focusing on the heroism piece, I kind of break out the difference between a brand new leader, you know, somebody who's just starting and, and been in charge, say, for the first time. There's a yeah. different kind of a syndrome there, and that's to try to be as smart as everybody, be as technically savvy as everybody that you're leading. And yeah. So you kind of get in everybody's way and you try to do everybody's work. And what you're really supposed to do is sit back and learn what, what the overall uh, level of effort is, what it could be, and then work on getting one to the other, right? Mm. If you get to a higher level of leadership in an organization, I like to refer people to an orchestra. The conductor is up there to make everything flow. The musicians are there to do their technical job. Yeah. If and I'll say, if, if you were watching an orchestra and the conductor jumped off the podium, ran over, grabbed a tuba, grabbed a violin, and just started playing the part because he didn't like the way it was, <laughs> it sounded, you think that was bizarre. 
Yet that's yeah. what senior leaders do all the time and middle, middle management. Rather than yeah. wait, train them properly up front, hope for the best, uh, analyze what happened, critique it, correct it, train again, and go back out and do it. Leaders feel like they somehow got to, if it's going to be, it's up to me, so I've got to jump in and make it happen. And that's just disruptive. Mm. And it's teaching everybody to sit back and let the leader take responsibility. Yeah, and that is such a great example because, I mean, if we were sitting there watching that audience, we'd just say, that's ridiculous. Yet we see it day in, day, day, in, day out in the corporate world where leaders are operating under that facade, the facade of, if it's got to be done right, I better do it. And, you know, to me, that's crazy when the development and the investment needs to be in the team to make sure that they can be doing the job to the to the standards that are required. So what are some of the biggest differences that you've seen from being a, a Navy SEAL, a, you know, being a leader in the Navy SEAL organization and being a leader outside in the business world? What are some of the fundamental differences that you see? Well, the first and probably greatest difference is that in the United States, the taxpayers spend about $2 million, $2.5 million per SEAL in training, preparation, the selection process. So if you're a leader and of a SEAL unit, what you get handed by the government of the United mm. States, let's say it's a 20-person team, you get 20 superstars. It's almost like a national, excuse me, a professional-level sports team. Yeah. They've already been vetted and trained and prepped and motivate, they're motivated and they're self-starting individuals. Every one of them feels like they could lead as well as you do and probably mm. could. So in that environment, and, and an elite units are much like this, you're spending most of your time trying to corral input and ideas and come up with some way of everybody, you know, mel uh, melding those inputs because yeah. everybody thinks they're right. And then because they are professionals, when you finally have to decide how we're going to do this, whether it's a kind of a, you know, not so much a consensus uh, or even a compromise because you meet, that usually ends up with something that's not very excellent, but when you finally come up with a hybrid of the best ideas and you lock it down, then everybody salutes that and says, let's go do that. No mm -hmm. griping, no compute, no complaining. Yeah. We're going to go execute that. And if it doesn't work out, well, then we'll try again next time. In the commercial world, if nobody's you know, training somebody and putting $2.5 $2 million mm -hmm. into them, selecting them for all those traits, and then handing them to any business owner or any business leader. What you get is just the regular person that's coming out of school and going out into the job market and they come to your organization with whatever positive or negative baggage they picked up with whoever they used to work for. They could be afraid yeah. of challenge or they could be, you know, looking forward to a challenge. They could be terrified to work in a team, a project environment, or, you know, they could be happy to do so. So you get a whole mixed bag of this kind of psychology mm. of the worker mindset based on wherever they came from there's no yeah. there's no common you know uh there's no common profile walking in the door which makes building cultures for leaders really critical on the commercial side it, it's yeah. it's it's absolutely uh you know critical that they do that once again an interesting thought process to to sort of channel into because one of the um things that i you know, that no doubt you see and many leadership development experts see is that there is a fear of, almost a fear of developing their team to the extent of, you know, the training that you described for the for the SEALs. It's, it's almost like you're coming on deck, you've got a job to do, I'm going to provide you, you know, some organisations, the bare minimum, some go more and over and above. But there's a fear of that, I, I guess that investment in the training to make them better people, better team members within organisations, there's the fear that they're not going to see a return on those dollars. Yet, I, I guess when you look at any sort of military or any sort of special unit or even professional sporting teams, the investment that goes into those teams to get the players to the level that they need to be is is quite obvious that the reason behind the performance that we that we see in the times that we need it. So what's preventing organizations from seeing that, from, from seeing that 
ability to develop their team and to make them better. Yeah, that's that's a very insightful point because it's it's a, it's kind of bifurcated into lower level management and their attitude towards training. It would include supervisors, middle management, and then senior management. You kind of hit on the attitude you hear a lot in senior management, and that is, I'm investing in my competitors, my competitors' employees, Mm -hmm. because at some point, Mm -hmm. if I don't pay the people I just poured all this money into, or I don't make them happy, they're going to go across the street, and my competitor is going to reap all the rewards. And so they they tend not to feel comfortable pouring a lot of money into the population. And it's kind of a mm. chicken and the egg thing, though. You know, if you if you don't invest in the people and you don't create a culture where the people believe, the employees believe that they're being nurtured and coached and mentored and improved professionally, and, and obviously yeah. you want to also have a pathway to greater opportunity within the organization based on that professional growth. Well, you're just you're basically just sealing a the deal. They're going to look for some other organization that is doing that. Mm. The lower level, yeah. middle management and supervisory management level there's a lot of job security issues. You, yeah. In the military, you always train your replacement because yeah. if, if you get shot, somebody else steps up and has to be whatever you were. If you're an officer, you're a mm. sergeant, whatever, you're the machine gunner, uh, somebody else has to be trained and qualified to step up and do what you were supposed to do as a primary function. So there's a frantic effort usually within combat units to make sure everybody can do their level best in almost everything that everybody's supposed to do. There's people assigned and there are people that are a little bit better than others, but that's so you have so much redundancy and so much, you know, depth of experience and capability Mm -hmm. that in combat, the loss of one or two people doesn't shut the whole unit uh, capability down. But in business, you see people hold, especially the middle and lower management. I don't want to train Susie or Joe because I know they're pretty sharp. And I'm not maybe as sharp mm. all the time. And my boss is going to find out that they're smart about this. And next thing you know, boom. So there's there's mm. a lower kind of lower level tampening of this from a more job security point of view. Yeah. And an upper level, uh, uh, I guess, neglect and or apprehension about investing, which is based on that. If we train them and we, we pour the money in, they're just going to walk out. And you know what? So what? You know, uh, Jack Welch of uh, General Electric once said, that when he was first hired or, or you know, developed into mm-hmm. uh, the CEO, he said, well, why me? And they said, because you're the only one qualified in all of General Electric. Mm-hmm. He said, oh, okay, so I won by default. He said that he wanted to make sure that didn't happen the day he had to be replaced. And so he created all kinds of mechanisms, mm-hmm. leadership training academies and things internally. And one of his proudest achievements was when he was going to retire, there was 10 to 12 candidates for his job that, in his opinion, were all equally capable of taking over the helm at GE. Yeah. And within a year or two, six or seven of those, he said, went off to major corporations in the United States and did a fantastic job. It's just, you mm-hmm. you got to decide whether you're going to be optimistic, positive, and be a nurturing kind of a developmental leader or not. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's in many ways, it's about the legacy that we want to leave as a leader as well, you know, that development of people. And it, I think to have that choice is is fantastic. And one of the things that I, that I see is that if people aren't being valued or invested in, you know, they're more inclined to leave anyway, um, apart from the fact that those that say, well, I'm not going to get a job anywhere else, so I might as well just hang low here, which is... You know, I, I sort of call those people the the working dead so that they're just in their job, just doing enough to hold on and and just being paid enough to, not to leave. So one of the, um, the conundrums that we see with leadership development is are leaders made or born? And I guess coming from a military aspect um, or the Navy SEALs, um, have, I, I welcome your view on that because do you see leaders, natural leaders, as advantageous or is it something that can be developed? And, and I guess, can anyone be developed as a leader? Yeah. So, yeah, I touch on that and be nimble also because it comes up all the time. And we had the same, the same philosophical debate discussion when I was in the military because – yeah. It's back to, to resources. How much can you pour into somebody to make them a better leader? And what if you can't make them a better leader because you believe in nurture instead of nature or nature mm-hmm. instead of nurture? So 
if it's not in their DNA, no matter how much money you spend or time, it's just not going to help. But again, in the military, you don't have a choice. If people are assigned to be leaders, the officers or officers are supposed to lead, you've got to do your level best, roll up your sleeves as either trainers of these officers and leaders or senior officers to yeah. make sure they're not left behind and everybody gets up to some level. But then the crucible of decision-making in a crisis kind of brings out a different thing. And I think that you can lead and be taught to lead. And this is, I think, I think leadership yeah. is different than management. I think management's mm -hmm. about maintaining and sustaining uh, approved processes and making sure the talent's working to their resumes and, and that, um, the systems are all operating and all that. I think leadership is what you need when all that stuff starts falling apart for some reason from either an external threat yeah. or an internal threat. And, but leadership can probably be trained up to a certain level of crisis uh, response, a certain level of ability to cope with a crisis. But then you get to this kind of threshold, even in the military. Yeah. And that's when somebody steps up and does something that's like crazy and amazing. You, you, I've been in that situation. You see somebody... Everybody else is scared, and this one person is dead calm, half a smile on their face. They're looking around, and they're making judgments, and they can see the whole picture in their mind, and they just start saying, let's do this, let's do that. And everybody follows mm. them. And that's the same thing if somebody suddenly, in a building that's on fire, they step into that role. There's something about them that they yeah. see the moment, they see it cleanly and clearly, and they make really simple but clean judgments Everybody else notices it, recognizes it, and they just follow them. Even if they weren't trained to be the leader yeah. in the fire, you know, they, they just have that ability. So I think that's kind of where I've, I'm at on this. You can train them. They, the leaders can handle crisis up to a certain level, but once the crucible gets a little bit too crazy, you're going to start seeing more of a, a, of a, a nature breakout, in my opinion. So raising the thermostat in many ways and creating the crisis potentially could, should be part of our leadership development program. Absolutely. Who takes the lead in a crisis. So how do you capture that? I mean, I'm just trying to think. I was working back in my day, I was working with a, a gentleman who firmly believed in um, leadership experiences should be real life and we should be put into rooms and dealt with very confronting situations and seeing how our, our leadership teams operated and worked in those particular areas. And this particular idea sounded exciting to, to many of the people that worked with him, but never gained traction within that particular organisation. And, and, you know, I can probably understand why, because, you know, if you're not comfortable in those sorts of scenarios, potentially there's there's going to be a bit of backlash and people leaving and and what have you. But how, how can you see what a person's going to bring outside of actually being in a real-life crisis? Well, here's the problem. Uh, you could, I, I believe in scenario-based training to accomplish what you're talking yep. about. You set up the scenarios, and they're, they're basically uh, case studies and people role-play, <clears throat> and they make decisions, and you start to kind of build up a, a repetition of, of the judgment cycle that is based on little to no information. Because that's really what a real crisis is mm -hmm. all about. You don't know what the right answer is. Yeah. So you have to start um, training people for that that weird moment where you're not going to get all your systems and processes and your people feeding you the answer. You're not going to send an email and say how, why, and somebody's going to come back and give you an answer. It's not going to be there. So you can do that. You can do that through scenario yeah. training, and it doesn't have to be laborious. You can do that in 30 minute time frames. You can base it on real things mm -hmm. that have happened in the company in the past. Just change the dates and names so they're actually... And then afterwards, you say, this is something that actually happened to this company. Or this is something that happened to one of our competitors. Or this is something that happened to somebody in our industry. And, and you can learn that way. You can also learn by reading. Almost any good biography yeah. of any leader, almost any uh, walk of, of, of life, whether it's the military, political, um, and business... They will lay out, usually, if, they're, if it's a good book, they'll lay out all their failures, all their faults, and how they dealt with it, and how they suffered through it, and how they somehow overcame that. You read that, and you're, again, it's like scenario prep. You're reading through those judgment, mm -hmm. those judgment moments. Uh, we had a crisis in the SEAL teams in the uh, mid-1980s. We, we were starting to do hostage rescue. And up until that point, we were primarily open field guys doing reconnaissance or doing jungle fighting like Vietnam. 
And this required us yeah. to go into a room shooting live bullets and, and try to figure out where the, you know, where the bad guys were and where the hostage was. And it was all videotaped. Mm. What we found was when you had to start making decisions and give orders as you're moving through a, a target building, it wasn't the officers or even the senior enlisted guys that were making the calls. They were, they were, a lot of them were freezing up. Okay. That's back to what I was telling you before about the, the threshold of, of crisis. Their mm. brains were like, you know, two steps below air traffic control where they, they couldn't manage all that stuff going on in their head, mm. stay calm and make a call. And somebody else would suddenly make a call and it was the right call and you'd go, they'd roll the tape later, they go, some yeah. junior guy. So eventually what we did is we said, what are we yeah. gonna do? We're gonna say, you know, do this and say everybody that didn't show up and didn't make good decisions, you're no longer a leader. So then we just changed, we changed the uh, tactics. And anybody that sees the call in the room can make the room. You, go, you give the shout, everybody follows your, your, your move. It all started to flow again. Yeah. We took away that only the leaders can make yeah. the decisions because of that actual discrepancy between yeah. different, different, the w different ways that different brains worked in that, in that, uh, in that kind of crunch time mm. with a lot, of, a lot at stake. Yeah, I can certainly see that as being the best way to move forward, especially in those situations. But I'm just visualizing the boardroom now and I'm visualizing that senior marketing executive or the senior logistics or the, the guy in charge of operations allowing a junior leader to come up with the suggestion yeah. on the way forward for their particular department. So, and I guess that's the challenge, isn't it? Because a lot of what you just talked about relies on that trust aspect. We, we've trained our people. They're, they're good people. Um, people are going to step up in various situations and we trust that and people trust that process. Whereas within that corporate boardroom, we've got a lot of ego. At yeah, time, I, I don't we? minimize that that difficulty because I don't know any other way to do it. I mean, I was I was raised from 17 mm. to 37 with this open. Everybody just tries their best. And then if it didn't work out, you have a professional critique session and you fix whatever it was mm. you didn't do right. And it doesn't matter who you are or what your rank yeah. was. So I do think the scenario training is something that, that you can do. Um, I was an instrument rated pilot for a couple of years and you go through and all the, the pilot training and the, and the certifications, they make you go through a verbal and then eventually either through a simulator or in the air, uh, all the different uh, casualty responses. And some of them are cascading. You do this wrong. They know that you just caused yeah. two other things to go wrong. And so your actions actually cause mm other bad things to happen or they cause the right thing to happen. And it's all verbal. You sit there for two, three hours with a um, aviation examiner mm. and they're just hitting you with, okay, this happens. Okay. You look at your fuel. This happens. That light goes on. What do you do? That's scenario based training. And believe it or not, even yeah. though you're not in a cockpit, it can actually get really stressful because your brain's freaking out trying to remember what the heck it is you're supposed to do. You know, and, and they know that and they put you in some weird situations and eventually you actually get in a simulator, then you yeah. get into the cockpit of a real plane and they do it all over again. That, so you can do yeah. that in, this, in, the bil in a building yeah. with, with, with people working yeah. in an organization. There's nothing keeping you from doing that. Yeah, yeah it's just uh, about the relevant scenarios and, you know, making it as real as possible as well so that people are feeling that particular stress or pressure, I would imagine. So one thing that's always am amazed me about leaders, especially people like yourself, um, Marty, it's you seem to have a lot of things going on at the moment. So you've you've worked in a pretty intense role with the, the Navy SEAL and now from you're writing books, you're running organisations, um, your energy seems to be, based on what, what I'm seeing today, seems to be high. Um, how do you maintain that motivation, that productivity, the engagement, the energy? How do you do that? And what are some tips that you can give to, yeah, to leaders? Yeah, um, I believe that, you know, life until it's over is one big opportunity. And I don't, I don't ever believe that what my parents or some parents say or society sometimes says that you can only be one thing or you have to come up with your master plan when you're 18 years old yeah. or your master plan if you come out of school. Um, I don't believe in that. I mean, mm. I, I'm 64 years old. 
I've, I've had three major careers and, and they were all long careers. So I could have a fourth mm -hmm. or a fifth career until the, until the day that, uh, you know, the, the guy upstairs decides that's enough. So I feel very comfortable in looking at something else to do that might excite me, like consulting or writing books, whatever, and then trying to mm -hmm. learn what I need to learn, entering as an apprentice, eventually get up to kind of a journeyman level of understanding, and then working my tail off to get to a master level. And I may or may not segue yeah. as a full profession, like right now I'm writing and being a CEO, but uh, I'm not afraid of that. And what I tell people when I talk to them is, at least in the United States, I'll ask, how many years does it take to become an engineer? How many years does it take to become a lawyer? How many years does it take to become a doctor? How many, and how, how old are you? Mm -hmm. I'm 32, I'm 36, I'm 38. How old would you be if you took those years and added it on there? You'd be a doctor at 30, 37. You'd be an engineer at 40, 43. And they all kind of look mm -hmm. at me weird. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to work. You're supposed to know what you're going to do. Yeah. Your profession's locked in. And by the time you're 30, you're supposed to be yeah. there, you know? No. All that opportunity's yeah. out there. You want to start a restaurant? Do it. You want to be a farmer? Do it. Learn about it. You know, become smart and figure it out. Apprentice under somebody who knows how to be a farmer or a restaurant owner. And then just do it. And mm. that keeps me excited yeah. about waking up in the morning. It keeps me excited about, you know, moving through the, the timeline of life. Excellent. It's so many people would look at that scenario of, you know, undertaking some study at thirty or thirty-five to to change careers, and I could imagine the con what they're talking about in their head is things like I'm too old, I should have done it earlier, you know, all of that stuff. But the reality, as you say, you could be a doctor by the time you're thirty-nine. How how would that make you feel? And and you know, it's about looking at it in a different way. I'm always um. I'm always um, refer back to a, just a very simple concept and um, of two um, people, a husband and wife, and, and the wife's 65 or something, and she goes to the husband and she says, I'm going to do a, a go out and do my Bachelor of whatever it might be, Bachelor of Business or Bachelor of Management. And, um, and the husband turns to her and says, you're going to be 69 by the time you finish it. And she says, well, I'm going to be 69 mm -hmm. anyway. So, and, and to me, it's just such a, a nice little segue that we can either be 69 and just be that age or we can actually be doing something that's growing us and expanding us and, and making us better. And I, and I think that that's such a, a beautiful, simple message. So, um, Marty, obviously, to have achieved what you've achieved, you've obviously had some inspiring figures in your journey. Who's inspired you most in your journey? From a leadership standpoint, uh, there's a gentleman named Duke Leonard. Uh, he was an enlisted SEAL at the very end of Vietnam in the U.S. Navy. He became an officer, and when I was a, when I became an officer after 10 years of being an enlisted SEAL, I looked around to, you know, to, to find somebody to emulate. And, and I'd seen a lot of officers from the standpoint of being an enlisted guy. Mm -hmm. and, and he was calm. He was almost serene. He was so calm. And I watched him in stressful situations, and I watched how he interacted with people. He was okay with people failing. He was okay with people falling a little short. And then he would, he would usually come up and just say one or two words, part encouragement and part a pat on the back for getting as far as they did. And so mm. when he walked away, he felt like you'd kind of been admonished, but you'd also kind of been told you did a pretty good job, you know? And I thought, I, I want to be that guy. I, I want to be, I want to be like yeah. Duke. <laughs> and so I tried to, to pattern my leadership yeah. style after him. And I wasn't the only person that felt that way about his, his approach to leadership. And I actually carry that, that same approach. I still emulate him to this day. Um, I, I saw him about five, six years ago, and uh, I told him that. Now, that's probably the, the person that's had the greatest impact on me as a leader. Um, I mean, other than that, I mean, I have five kids. You know, I have a daughter, Tara, who's living there in Sydney right now. Um, they influence mm. me. I think about them all the time. And they, when I think about them and my five grandkids, I, I think about what we just talked about. I think mm. I, I need to show them that it's okay. 
It's okay at 64, 74, 84. Go for it. Do what you want to do. Uh, take a deep breath. Put in the work to figure out whatever the new is and, and get good at it. Mm. And then excel. And if you want to switch gears later on, do it. I want them to see me doing that. Mm. And the thought of them kind of makes me feel like I've got to, I've got to stick to this. So maybe someday that, you know, they'll be having a talk like this with somebody. <laughs> Excellent. What, what about leaders? We spoke a little bit about emerging leaders. What are some of the traits that you believe leaders need to have today to be successful tomorrow? I think tomorrow? the very first thing is intellectual humility. I talk a lot about it in, uh, in both books, actually. The, the idea that you need to clear your mind of, of all the, the thoughts of how great you are or how much you know so that you can go to the next step, mm -hmm. which is intellectual curiosity. Because if you have intellectual curiosity, you can then have intellectual creativity. And for most leaders, the place where you really start to, to make, your, uh, you know, make your way and, and pay your way is being a creative, nimble, agile problem solver. Whether, whether that problem is redesigning yeah. an organization or hiring a, the, the best person for a key position, but if you walk in there with all that baggage in the back of your mind, you apply whatever happened to you in the past to whatever's happening to you right now, you're going to ignore all the new inputs. You're going to get tunnel vision. You're not going to listen to all the rest of the data that, that conflicts mm -hmm. with your, your history and what you think is right. So that's, that's the key one for me, intellectual humility. I think you have to have optimism. I think you have to have a sense yeah. of optimism that then informs and affects your your life energy, you know, when you wake up. Because if you wake up as an optimist and all things are possible, then the rest of your day is, you know, an oyster, right? You can you can almost achieve anything or start mm. to achieve something new every single day. So if you're an optimist, you'll be a better leader. Usually optimists are better at intellectual humility too. And the third thing is you have to have a sense yeah. of humor. Because if you can't let the yeah. failure roll off, off your back, uh, if you can't, see failure for what it is, which is something that's going to make you wiser and, and improve your judgment the next time, um, you're going to be a miserable person. So, you know, mm. even, even if you start, if you started the day optimistic, <laughs> you're, you're still going to be a miserable person. So those are the three, intellectual humility, optimism, and humor. Excellent. Great tips. Let's talk a little bit more about failure. How would you describe your relationship with it, with failure? Yeah. So when I started out, I'd say it was more sobering. Um, I wanted to be good. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be the best seal, you know, I could possibly be. I was 125 pounds when I joined the Navy. I was about 130 the day I walked into a seal team and I by no means looked like the rest of the guys in the building. So I tried to lift weights. I tried to, you know, be the best shot. I tried to do everything I could possibly do. And I obviously wasn't, I, I was going to yeah. fail. So failing like being the best all the time. So I've just, it was very sobering and kind of depressing. About midway in my career, I remember probably when I was in my mid to late 30s, I started saying, well, I'm just going to ignore failure. Like it didn't happen. It's like a bump in the road. I'm just going to move on, right? That's the right way to handle it, by ignoring yeah. it. But now, say the last 10 years, I actually see failure as something to learn from, something to actually embrace, to study, to dissect. And to have it, yeah. you know, influence on how you're going to either prevent it from happening again or be better prepared if it does happen again. Mm. Yeah, great answer. Um, where's Marty Strong going? What's the vision? What What is it that you're aiming to achieve? Yeah, so right now world? I have, I'm the CEO of, a, of an organization that actually has two operating businesses in a healthcare and a government services business. That's my day job. Sometime within the next year or two, I'm going to segue into full-time consulting, speaking, and probably write a third book, you know, maybe more of a motivational business book. And I've, uh, I started down that path with writing the two books. Like I said, you know, you have to apprentice and work your way in. Yeah. So that's what I think I'm going to be doing. That's what I'm leaning into. That's what I've been learning about to become. And I will segue from being uh, an executive on a board and uh, move into that other life. I also, I also um, am helping on one uh, nonprofit board 
that teaches kids uh, technology and the other nonprofit board has to do with uh, helping veterans. So that that will be another fun aspect of my future life. Excellent. Now, we didn't talk about your second book either, so I, I promised that we would. So Be Nimble's out now. You've got yeah. Be Visionary coming out soon. So just give us a bit of a snapshot around what yeah, Be Visionary is Yeah, so Be Visionary is all about... Is all about strategy it's about what it takes for a leader to understand how to open up their mind so some of the things we just talked about intellectual humility and becoming creative mm. and then how do you take a vision once you've you've decided or learned how to look at the horizon and not just at next week's outcomes and take the vision and turn yeah. it into a strategy and develop it into something that could then go all the way to an operational plan or a campaign to achieve that strategy so that whole book kind of walks through an individual assessment, how you as a leader should see your role in being a strategist, being a visionary. And then let's talk about a vision, what it looks like, what it feels like, and move it to concept and move it to strategy and then move it to uh, operational development. And then there's you know, a whole process in there about how to use people in your organization to, to make that all happen. And then eventually to pitch it to somebody. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. It sounds uh, it sounds really great, and I'm I'm looking forward to getting my hands on a copy. So, how can people make contact? How can people sure. connect so, with you, Mark? Sure. Uh, so, Be Nimble's on Amazon. It's also on Amazon in Australia, and it's uh, if you go to MartyStrongBeNimble.com, both of my business books are there. A lot of my articles, uh, a little bit of my background. I've also written eight novels. I'm getting ready to publish the ninth here in uh, in June. So. Uh, the access to the novels are also there. So if you go to MartyStrongBeNimble.com, you'll get the full package right there. You just seem to have far too much going <laughs> on at the moment, Marty. But it, it's awesome to speak with people like yourself. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate leaders. it. If you're looking to build better leadership skills, check out the Today's Leader website at todaysleader.com.au. We really are driving a leadership revolution to build tomorrow's best leaders today. Today's Leader is a collective, the mindset to make a difference, the ability to create an impact. Think and Grow Business hosts our Today's Leader Mastermind. Think and Grow Business, where we focus on personal, professional and business growth, book your free 30-minute discovery call right from the homepage at thinkandgrowbusiness.com.au. Don't forget, wherever you are, you are standing stronger, braver and wiser. Don't forget the golden rule. Don't be an arsehole. I'll see you all again next week. Bye for now.